Hello, my name is Adrian Goldberg and welcome to the Byline Times podcast. The Byline Times is what the papers don't say, what radio doesn't report and what telly doesn't tell you. This time, in the latest of our series of interviews with England's regional elected mayors, we meet Andy Street, Mayor of the West Midlands, an area that covers Birmingham, the four boroughs of the Black Country, Coventry and Solihull. Andy is the former MD of the department store, John Lewis, and I'm meeting him at a flagship of the government's levelling up agenda, the offices of the Department for Communities, Housing and Levelling Up in the centre of Wolverhampton. Andy, welcome. Hi, Adrian. Nice to be here with you. Now, you've invited me to this very smart new office block in Wolverhampton, presumably because you think this tells a story about levelling up. And far more because we were here in Wolverhampton for other things. It was convenience more than anything else. But yeah, it does. You're quite right. So levelling up is really all about opportunities for people in the regions, the same as opportunities in London. And in a sense, the civil service and the senior civil service has been so concentrated in London. d as we now call them, have made this big commitment to the West Midlands, bringing their second headquarters here. About 250 people being employed here, but that includes people at a senior level, and they've recruited lots of those people locally. So it is, in a sense, emblematic of what's trying to be done. But people will look at the rhetoric around levelling up and you'll say that this is a physical embodiment of it as well but far too often I would put it to you that levelling up has fallen short in reality if you look at inequality in this country incomes for the poorest 14 million people fell by seven and a half percent incomes for the richest fifth saw an increase of 7.8 percent levelling up isn't happening in practice is it? So you're talking about an inequality across the whole of the country there. And yes, it is true that actually in the period, I'm not quite sure when your stats referred to, but if you look at the... 2022. Recent, yeah, yeah. If you look at the recent COVID period, there is no debating that it is the impact has fallen on people very differentially. So actually it has been toughest for the weakest members of society. That is a fact. But where I think the political dialogue around levelling up is really is about this geographical issue and on that there's a lot more to be done but we come at the end of the week of course where there's been a big devolution deal for the West Midlands and of course we come at the end of a period where we've seen a number of government announcements which are about investing outside London to try to address the long-term regional inequality. I'll talk about that new deal from the Chancellor. I just want to press you on levelling up though. This goes back to the 2021 levelling up fund round. 61% of the most deprived areas of England were not allocated any funding from the levelling up fund. It was a form of pork barrel politics, wasn't it, in which those who had the ear of the Prime Minister, even if they weren't particularly deprived, were able to attract funds. I don't think that's right, actually. I think that's a bit too straightforward, permit me to say, Adrian. Of course, not everywhere that applied got funding. We were very cross in the second round, not the first round that you refer to, that some of the toughest areas of the West Midlands, Wolverhampton included in that, actually didn't get any funding. They did in the first. But it's not right to say there was an overall payment in favour of more affluent places. Some less affluent places missed out, that's true. But if you look at overall, that's not the right thing to say. But there's a much bigger question than just looking at that fund. That fund was looking at 20 million here or there. My real criticism of that is you can't do levelling up in that piecemeal way. They're sort of random interventions. You've got to take a much more holistic, strategic thing. Look at the real underlying issues, the skills, qualities, job opportunities. They're the things that will really drive change over time. When I interviewed your counterpart on Merseyside recently, Steve Rotherham, he was talking about the idea that instead of applying for funds Mm. from specific Mm. funding rounds, regional mayors might be allocated a substantial sum of money from which they could then distribute it around their areas and that's what the Chancellor appears to have delivered on in the budget. That's the promise anyway of the budget. What will that mean for you in the West Midlands? This is something where cross-party the mayors have had the same view and it links to the levelling up fund. I described after levelling up fund the begging bowl politics where you ask for a little bit here and there and that phrase seems to have caught on actually. 
what the Chancellor said on Wednesday for both us and Greater Manchester, we hope others will follow, is that instead of that random begging bowl, there will be one single settlement at the next spending review, which will be for the West Midlands. It will be billions of pounds, and then we will decide how we spend that. So we can think how the different elements of it, a transport investment, an investment in a new skills programme, a new college maybe, where housing is regenerated, how the things come together. You might almost build on one another. And most importantly, the decisions will be taken close to the action, not by a civil servant in London. So he has delivered on our ask. So do you know how much that will be? Not yet. So let me just explain. We know what we're going to get over the next two years before we get to the next spending review, to be clear. So it was talked about a billion and a half this week just gone. That's money that we can see right now. So if you take some of the housing money, let me just be really clear for your listeners. So we know we're going to get £500 million over the next two years between brownfield regeneration and between affordable housing. But then we say at the new spending review, there has to be a new negotiation. And that's going to be across lots of buckets that are all individual at the moment. And that's why I say it will be billions. But we haven't started that negotiation yet. Neither have other like government departments who are going to do it. But we're now on the same equivalent level as them. And that's really, that's the breakthrough. That's the principle. And that's why I've described it as something of a sort of crossing the Rubicon moment. Because this government has actually said, we are going to trust people locally. We're going to give away power. And you know, in life, for anyone, it's hard to give away something that they've just worked very hard to achieve. So I do have respect for people who've said they will do that. So in theory, anyway, the end of begging bowl politics, there are some important differences, aren't there, in that Andy Burnham, your counterpart in Greater Manchester, has responsibility for health, for example, or a degree of health funding, which is not part of your responsibility in the West Midlands. So what exactly will you have responsibility for and what difference do you think it can make? That's right. Andy Burnham has responsibility for some elements of health. We, to be fair, have never asked for that. And there's a really important point here about we only want to do those things that we think are genuinely best done across a regional level. Some things are best done nationally. Some things are best done by local authorities, if not really, really hyper-local in the parish. But we're trying to do things at that sort of regional level. So where the cash will definitely come into one pot, all transport investment, housing and regeneration, post-16 skills, so not schools, but skills, technical education, careers. And then there's also some real breakthroughs, some funding around retrofitting, so very, very important, will be uh, devolved to us. And we'll also have influence over innovation funding and inward investment funding. So that's, again, new stuff that will be coming. So that will all sort of go into a pot. I personally think there'll be more about net zero as well, because by two years' time, there'll be a lot more funding added to the sort of things we've got at the moment, like the Industrial Decarbonisation Fund. So I'm expecting to be able to put together a pot on that as well. And retrofitting of residential... Of residential properties. Now, we've been trialling this in the sort of net zero target, Adrian. You know, we've said this region will be net zero by 2041, making great progress on transport. That's arguably the easiest. The toughest is residential properties. So we've started this winter, we're doing about a thousand homes, but... I'll be honest, it's only a beginning, but we're learning, we're making the market. And we're saying then that after the next spending review, we want devolution of literally hundreds of millions of pounds, our share of the national money to actually quicken the pace around that. Because we have set ourselves a really ambitious target of about 300,000 homes to be retrofitted to get to that net zero target. Once you've got this money, do you have the scope to challenge the direction of government? So that if national government says, and there's been a lot of flip-flopping around this at national government level, if national government says we don't really like onshore wind, for example, and you might say, well, as West Midlands Mayor, we believe there's a lot of scope for onshore wind power generation here. Mm -hmm. Do you have the scope to pursue that in the face of what Number 10 or the Cabinet might say? In theory, yes. I mean, this is about 
achieving objectives, not them specifying exactly how something's going to be done. I have a funny feeling the West Midlands will not be leaders in wind to energy production. Actually, but other examples. So let's take transport as an example of this, actually, because things were because we already have a big chunk of money that is devolved there. They call it, and it's not very fashionable branding. City region sustainable transport settlement. A bill it needed some help with branding. A billion pounds, and the point is, we decide what we're going to do. So come to an example yeah we've said we are going to innovate around a completely new light rail system very light rail as we call it we've done the innovation it'll be trialed in coventry the government didn't say you will do that we've come up with an answer to the twin challenges of mass transit and net zero we're deciding what we're doing with our hydrogen buses others are doing other forms so yeah we do have choices about the how what they hold us accountable for is the outcome at the end. Again, on housing, we've sort of trialled this, built trust over recent years. We've had a housing deal back in 2018. We've got about 650 million now through different pots that have gone into there. And we talk about how we're going to hit our housing target, about 16,000 homes a year. They do not say to us, it will be here. It'll be this mix of 10 years. We work that out. They're interested in holding us account to the big picture target. We decide what we're actually going to do. But you still get cash allocated according to a list of targets and ambitions that you set out to Whitehall. Yes, we do. Now, what's interesting in two years' time in the next spending review is just the degree of flex that there will be. And I honestly don't know where that will be. But you know what? That's okay, Adrian, at the moment, because this whole story of devolution, which People don't think devolution is a very sexy word. But if I said this whole story of local people taking responsibility for their decisions, I think people say, yeah, that's the right thing to do. We've been on a sort of story since 2010. And I'm okay that the story keeps deepening at different points because we've got to win the confidence and trust of government and get them to say, yeah, these people look to know what they're doing. We're going to trust them. And remember, they've only agreed this for two places so far. And I don't want to be too controversial here, but I'm pretty sure we in Greater Manchester were chosen as there was confidence that we'd made most progress, got the maturity. I want others to follow because I think it's right for everywhere. But it's all part of a sort of medium term game of taking people with us. And that's okay. When I spoke to Steve Rotherham, and you've mentioned transport here, we talked about how local government, regional government had powers over local transport removed from it. We had deregulation of the buses and we had a separation of buses from trains. Trams hadn't come on stream in the West Midlands then. And Steve was talking about, as other regional mayors as well, about having those powers back. And these were powers that were never given away from regional governments in London. Would you like that power here in the West Midlands? So it was 1985, I think. So this is quite complicated because there's different bits in this. So let me just try to explain. If you are talking about the power to franchise the bus service, i.e. we run the whole lot, we have not asked for that at the moment. The agreement of the whole West Midlands Combined Authority Board, cross-party, is at the moment we're doing what we call an extended partnership with all of our bus operators. Uh, We're keeping franchising in the back pocket, and if they don't perform, it's still there as a threat. But we are not moving to do that yet. But what we are trying to do is trying to achieve the outcome that some would say those powers in the 70s achieved, that things actually all work together as one system. Well, you don't need to go back to the 70s to discover this, do you? You can travel to London, you can get out of your pocket, your debit card, and you can travel on bus, train, tram, London Overground. It will all be part of one joined up system. And at the end of the day, your journey by whatever mode of public transport, the price of it will be capped And that is overseen by one authority. That does not happen in the West Midlands. Lots of it does happen. Let me explain. It's still all overseen by one coordinating authority, Transport for the West Midlands. And if you go to our control centre in the centre of Birmingham, there are the screens showing 
all the different modes, trams, trains, bikes, light rail, everything all coming together. So it is one system with one branding. And we're standing at a place where the metro is just about to link straight on to the main railway station in Wolverhampton, as it does elsewhere. What doesn't happen yet, to be totally fair with you, is it is not all actually run by one operator, as TfL do in London. It's run by a series of different companies. We actually run the tram ourselves. To answer your question straight up, we are not yet moving to ask to run it all ourselves because we believe we can achieve the same outcome with all this different operation. And let's remember, who's paying for this? In our case, National Express have spent hundreds of millions of pounds on buying new buses. In Coventry, we have the all-electric city. We're having the biggest hydrogen fleet in Western Europe. There are so many of our zero-emission buses around this region. We've seen with West Midlands Trains, again, a private company, but have spent nearly a billion pounds on new rolling stock. If it wasn't done by them, we, as the public sector, the taxpayers of the West Midlands, would be picking up that bill. So I would put it to you that it is not a free choice for taxpayers suddenly to say they want to run that. I happen to believe the private sector can play a crucial role. One last thing on capping, because it's important. You can do what you described about London if you have a regional swift pass. You cannot yet do it on debit cards here. That is fair. You can do it for capping on buses on their own, for example. But we will be moving very shortly to a capping on debit cards exactly the same as London. And for people listening outside the West Midlands, just to explain, if you want that swift card yeah. you have to go to an office you have to have your photograph taken you have to go through a process That's in right. london you can rock up with your debit card today and that technology i've been told by transport for london was offered to the government for all local authorities across the country and the government said no so we have this particular system in the West Midlands yeah, called SWIFT. Swift. Yeah, the second biggest system after London. And it just seems to me at the moment, and you say you're moving towards yeah, a system where we can just use one piece of plastic without having to pre-register, and that will be solved. Do you know when that will be? Yeah, it's in about 15 months. I so said, we've got the cash for it. The IT work's all being done. But before that, any resident can do it with SWIFT. And any visitor can, of course, get a SWIFT card as well when they arrive in the region. I know it's not quite as good as London. I have just got to deal with the issues in front of me. And that's why we're coming to that. One other thing, by the way, the tech that we're doing is actually then going to be deployed across the whole of the rest of the country. So I didn't actually know what you said about TfL's offer. But we are now having responsibility for designing the solution for everywhere. Effectively, though, in the UK, and I appreciate this isn't the West Midland Mayor's responsibility, but we've designed the same thing twice, haven't we? Because it already works in London. It works with TfL. Yeah, and I suspect we'll be using quite a bit of the same stuff, actually, but we'll be applying it to all of our systems with each of the operators as well. And by the way, remember one other thing. In London, I don't think you do use it actually on mainline trains. I think we'll be the first area that you use it on mainline trains as well. Talking about transport, it was recently announced that the second phase of HS2 from Birmingham to Crewe yeah. has been postponed and the route from Birmingham to London will not, when it's first up and running, go to Euston. It will go to West London. What do you make, honestly, of where we're at with HS2? I've got two reactions to that, and it's very fair that you ask. The first reaction is that the Birmingham to Old Oak Common, the place you mentioned in West London piece, is to go ahead on time. It's full steam ahead, no delays to all the contracting there. And my first reaction is we've got to get on and get that first section of it open to begin to get the benefits of it as quickly as possible. And it's actually reassuring that that is literally happening. About 10,000 people currently employed. My second reaction, to be entirely honest with you, is it's really disappointing. There'll be delays elsewhere. But the government is utterly committed both to Euston, you've heard the Chancellor's Exchequer talking about that, and indeed to Manchester. And you know what? I know it will happen from Euston to Manchester because the truth is, and this might be an odd thing for a Brummie to say, but it's true, there is no earthly sense in a line that just goes to Birmingham. We've got to have the full national connectivity. That's what the business case is based on. And so I'm confident it will happen. And so you then say, well, is it reasonable that there should be a delay? And I have to say, 
much as it hurts me to say as a Brummie, it probably is. The costs have gone up. You can't ignore that. And so what the government are saying is we've actually got to spread the cost over a little longer time. I think they think they've said two years. And that does seem reasonable, particularly as we're pushing on as fast as we can to get it open. And that will mean we're testing the technology, getting benefits in terms of inward investment in Birmingham as quickly as possible. Is it reasonable, though? There have been critics who say that what the Treasury is doing is effectively confusing capital spending with revenue spending. If you spend the money now, you will get the payback more quickly in the West Midlands and in the areas further north. Yeah, but that's why the first part of my answer is really important, because exactly that is why there has been not a moment's delay in the first phase of it from Curzon Street through Interchange South. But coming to the second half of it, to the north, that what they've said is that they will try to maintain the Manchester opening date. It is simply a delay on that crew section. That's all that's been announced. And the reason I think that is understandable is this, that the Treasury and the Department of Transport have only got a certain amount of capital they're going to spend every year. And if they put so much of it into HS2, that leg, it means that some of our other transport schemes, those in Liverpool, Manchester, will be squeezed. And so what the Secretary of State has done is said, I can prevent that squeezing elsewhere by accepting this delay. And I do think that is a fair trade-off. This may be the brummy chip on my shoulder coming through, but I think this also applies to people who live in the northern powerhouse who've seen the plans for significant improvements in the railways. They're scaled back. And we look at London and we see the massive project that is the Elizabeth Line, augmenting what is already, by our standards, a fantastic underground network in London. And we look at that and we think... How come that when the cuts happen, when the delays happen, they happen in the West Midlands, they happen in the North West, London manages to get its Elizabeth Line? Well, hang on a minute. Um, London's Elizabeth Line was at least two years delayed, so I don't think they think of it as all utopian. But you do make a really important point. One of the reasons why London is an economic powerhouse and no other city in the country is anywhere near it is that over decades... There's been huge overinvestment in London and underinvestment in the rest of the country. HS2 is actually to try to answer that. And I don't think we can have too much of a chip, to use your words, when actually probably best part of 40 billion is being spent on the Birmingham phase of HS2. So we can't argue that we have been underinvested in in that way. And if you look at regional investment in transport, we're spending about seven times per head what we were spending just a few years ago so the government has belatedly i accept and it's over decades many different governments have put too much into the southeast insufficient elsewhere but we are steadily readdressing that the west midlands was in part anyway one of the urban areas that was most pro brexit even birmingham the city unlike most other major cities was very slightly pro-Brexit. There are parts of the West Midlands, places like Dudley, that were amongst the most pro-Brexit in the country. What is your estimate of the impact of Brexit on the West Midlands, a place that relies on manufacturing, that relies on export? It's actually very difficult to uh, disentangle Brexit, COVID, global supply chain difficulties, energy, but there is no question that our manufacturing output is less now than it was before all those changes came. And some of it is definitely due to the change in the terms of trade with Europe. It's been more difficult for our manufacturers to export. So I don't think anyone is questioning that. So I come to the very simple fact that the majority of the people here supported Brexit and indeed the country decided. So what we have to do now is rebuild those manufacturing economies, rebuild that exporting and trade. And the good news is we've seen it begin to improve about 7% in the last year. But there's no hiding the fact we have had a big setback, but we have to rebuild now. But does that put greater onus on government to ensure that we have as close to possible as frictionless trade with the EU and that government in its behaviour, in its posture since Brexit, has actually 
gone in the opposite it, direction. It puts all sorts of responsibilities. Yes, we have to make it as easy as possible, despite the fact we've left the EU, to be able to trade with the EU. But no. would you accept that we haven't done that? At government level, we haven't done that. I think there's been less progress than anyone would have hoped. And of course, the big issue is their eye was suddenly taken to the COVID ball. But there's evidence now with the Northern Ireland Protocol that the ball is very much in focus. But it also means some other things. We've got to get on and improve our exports to the rest of the world. And there's very clear evidence that the West Midlands is stepping forward in that. But it also means, because there's technological issues here as well as Brexit issues, that we've got to think about which other parts of our economy have got to get really on steroids. And the good news is there's very clear evidence that there's growth coming there, whether it's in professional services, whether it be in med tech, whether it be in logistics, whether it be in all sorts of the new areas, including creative. You know, that's why we're trying to get better at some of the other things, because one of the stories of the West Midlands, although we're deeply proud of our manufacturing, got some superb companies, we have been too reliant on some sectors. So we've got to diversify. So if you were looking to attract an international business today yeah. to invest in the West Midlands, yeah. and that international business was thinking, well, look, it's going to be harder for me now to access the EU market than yeah. if I located my business in Belgium yes. or in Germany, for example. What could you say to yeah. offer them the West Midlands as a viable place? It's a very interesting question because I've just had a lot of experience of this because I was out in India selling our investment opportunities there because they're now our second biggest investor into the West Midlands. And there's one overriding thing, and that is the quality of our research and development, often in our universities, and in particular, the quality of the talent and the skilled people that there are to make those businesses successful. So if we're talking about an area like electric vehicle manufacturer, which is a really competitive area, the fact we've got the best, most talented people in the world, that tends to override almost anything else. So it's the people that become the biggest asset of all. Thank you. That's Andy Street, the elected mayor of the West Midlands. My name is Adrian Goldberg, and you've been listening to the Byline Times podcast, funded by subscriptions to the Byline Times, our fabulous monthly newspaper. To find out how to subscribe, go over to our news-breaking website, bylinetimes.com. That's bylinetimes.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again soon. Cheers now. Bye-bye.